good morning again. Thank you for being with us. Um, <clears throat> with us for this part of our making the, the movement toward a level playing field program today is Brad Snyder, the Anne Fleming Research Professor at Georgetown Law School. Brad teaches constitutional law, constitutional history, and sports law. Prior to teaching, uh, Brad worked as an associate at Williams and Connolly and wrote two critically acclaimed books about baseball, including the subject of what we're going to talk about today, A Well-Paid Slave, Kurt Flood's Fight for Free Agency in Professional Sports. He is a graduate of Duke University and Yale Law School, and he clerked for the Honorable Dorothy W. Nelson on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He is the author of the recently published book, Democratic Justice, Felix Frankfurter, the Supreme Court, and the Making of the Liberal Establishment. Before we have Brad start with his wonderful uh, presentation and discussion, we have a short video that we are going to play. It's a little bit of orientation for our discussion. So bear with us one moment. The legality of Major League Baseball's controversial reserve clause is now in the hands of the Supreme Court. The case involves the trade of Kurt Flood from St. Louis to Philadelphia. That case for Flood is being argued... It was so difficult for the fans to understand my problems with baseball. I was telling my story to deaf ears because I was telling my story to a person who would give their firstborn child to be doing what I was doing. And he just could not understand how there could be anything possibly wrong with baseball. For nearly three years, Kurt Flood had been in the courts, fighting a one-man battle with Major League Baseball over the reserve clause. Despite the advice of the Players Union, he had left the game in 1969, rather than be traded against his will. What I told him was that I agreed with him in principle, but that the courts had treated players as property and would likely do so again, and that his uh, attempt, while uh, a principled one, was, uh, uh, I thought, doomed to failure. And I worried about his knowing uh, the kinds of chances he was taking, that he was going to end his career uh, in a case that uh, uh, probably was a loser. The lawyers for the major leagues would not talk for the cameras, but in the courtroom they argued that the reserve clause is essential to the future of organized baseball. That without the reserve clause, all the rich teams would get all the star players. But Arthur Goldberg maintains that the reserve clause, tying a player to one team for the rest of his life, is in violation of the 13th Amendment. That's the amendment against slavery and indentured servitude. Flood's first trial had been in federal district court in Manhattan in 1970. I think uh, Kurt Flood on the stand was treated miserably by the federal judge. He, he almost taunted him. A judge who showed great respect for almost all witnesses who, who were white. Um, uh, from the bench, the, the, the judge uh, asked uh, Kurt Flood, uh, this is not as easy as playing center field, is it? Uh, you know, with a sarcastic tone in the middle of a difficult cross-examination. No active player dared testify on his behalf. Only owner Bill Veck and a handful of retired stars came to Flood's defense. Jackie Robinson walked into the courtroom and there was a hush. He had such a presence that you could hear a pin drop. His hair was white and he was walking with a cane, but he still had that swagger that Jackie Robinson uh, was so noted for. But he testified in my behalf and with a soliloquy that would send chills up and down my spine. Flood lost in district court and then lost again in the Court of Appeals. And on June 18th, 1972, by a vote of five to three, the United States Supreme Court ruled against him. Baseball was still exempt from antitrust laws, and the reserve clause still stood. 
I am particularly pleased that the court has recognized the need for a reserve system and has further recognized that baseball has not disregarded the extremely important position the player occupies. Over the long history of baseball, the reserve system has constantly evolved to improve the position of the player. I am confident that this process will continue. We lost because my guys, my colleagues, didn't stand up with me. And I can't make any excuse for them. Had we shown any amount of solidarity, if the superstars had stood up and said, we're with Kirk Flood, if the superstars had walked into the courtroom in New York and made their presence known, I think that the owners would have gotten the message very clearly and given me a chance to win that. Kurt Flood never played Major League Baseball again. Brad Snyder, author extraordinaire, a well-paid slave, Kurt Flood's fight for free agency in professional sports. And I've had the pleasure of listening to you speak in the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court paused to re-argue the case in a mock trial format a few years ago, which then led to me getting your book autographed, which I appreciated. And I'm so thrilled that you could join us today uh, on the 50th anniversary of Flood versus Kuhn. And I know uh, there have been other commemorations, uh, and but I'm delighted you could take the time today to pause and to, and to share a little bit about that. Uh, so I want to thank you, Brad, so much for that. And for those uh, who are watching the camera, Brad was also kind enough last night to uh, be interviewed about his uh, current book, on uh, Felix Frankfurter, which has been critically acclaimed by the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And that's on you, or soon to be on YouTube. Uh, so thank you for all of that. You're a rock star. and uh, But we're here to talk about baseball. We're here to talk about... Uh, the Kurt Flood experience, and sort of the the current state of what is a really a uh, constitutional law aberration where organized baseball, Major League Baseball, still enjoys an exemption from antitrust when other professions, call it basketball, football, are not. Unbelievable, but here we are. So, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Brad. I know you have a, a little bit of a presentation, and then we'll pick up some Q&A thereafter. So thank you. Hey, uh, Brad, check your mic. I think it's... Uh, I'm muted. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Uh, good. Yep. I'm a little worse for wear this morning, but, uh, you know, I hope you'll... Uh, I, and I wish I could have been there in person. Uh, I, I saw the photos of Robert Jackson arguing at Nuremberg um, behind the podium. And uh, I, I wish I could have been standing there. I would have been honored to be there in person. I have a household with the flu, um, but I'm, I'm totally willing uh, to, 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 to go today as long as I, you know, I've got tea here. I'm, I'm good to go. So I just, I just sound bad. So I, I apologize for that. And, and I apologize for not being there um, in person. Um, I really, it's really that Ken Burns documentary is um, really important. I thought it did went a long way um, to showing a wide audience who Kurt was, um, what his lawsuit was about, um, and also just how smart he was, right? How um, intellectual he was and, and just um, what a deep thinker he was. Uh, it, it's amazing that that kind of five minute clip, um, you know, there, there are parts of that five minute quip, clip I would um, quibble with, you know, because you have to compress things, but just, Kurt himself narrating his own story and, and telling his own story. There was so much um, power there. And I, and I feel like um, the Ken Burns documentary, as I'll get to at the end, um, went a really long way to rehabilitating Kurt's um, reputation and, and it was really kind of a high water mark um, in Kurt's post-baseball career. So I'm glad he got um, the, the public recognition um, that went along with that documentary. And I'm 
really grateful to Ken Burns for doing it. So I just want to sort of back up a second and, and try to give people a sense who weren't alive at the time. And I would put myself in that category. Um, I had little idea um, when I started my, when I was a young sports writer in Baltimore, just how good of a ball player Kurt was. And I think that gets a little lost um, in all of the discussions about lawsuits and exemptions. And, and for those of you who weren't alive then or who weren't following um, baseball um, in the 1960s, um, Kurt Flood was the longest tenured member of the St. Louis Cardinals when he was traded. The Cardinals were a juggernaut. He was um, a seven-time Gold Glove winner. He was a three-time All-Star um, on teams that, you know, the Cardinals won the World Series in 64 and 67. They lost in 1968 in part because Kurt dropped a fly ball in, in, in late in Game 7. Um, but, you know, Kurt was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. You may chalk that up to the Sports Illustrated jinx um, in uh, 1968 as baseball's best center fielder. That's what it, the tagline said. There's a um, picture of Kurt um, in Wrigley Field going high up against the wall um, to, to, to rob someone of a home run or an extra base hit. And, and Kurt was really good. I mean, I guess people from my generation – um, who watched baseball in the 80s and 90s, I'd really analogize him to someone like um, Bernie Williams, who was the center fielder for the um, you know, Yankees during you know, their great championship run. Um, Bernie, I'd say, was a star, but not a superstar. And I'd put Kurt in the same category as a star, um, but not a superstar. And as the documentary said, um, after the 1969 season on October 7th, 1969, just a few um, days ago from today, um, he was traded to the Philadelphia Phillies, and I, I along with Tim McCarver, um, for um, and and the main player coming back um, was um, Richie Allen, and, and I just want to put in context um, how what getting traded from the Cardinals to being traded to the Philadelphia Phillies was like back then. The Cardinals were the best organization. I mean, in MLB at the time, and the Phillies were definitely the worst. And um, the Phillies were regarded for black players um, as, a, as a prison sentence, um, as, a, as a horrible place to go. Um, Kurt, in his autobiography, described Philadelphia as baseball's um, northernmost southern city. And I thought that was pretty apt. And, and Kurt knew that because um, one of his good friends from the Cardinals, Bill White, had been traded to the Phillies. And had told um, Kurt how horrible it was. And um, the Philadelphia fans gave Richie Allen, um, an, uh, one of their star players who was traded for Kurt, a horrible time there. So um, it, it, was, um, it was the principle of being the longest tenure member of the Cardinals, being treated like a piece of property. But also it was this idea that, you know, not the general manager didn't even call Kurt that morning on uh, October 7th. Um, there was kind of a person mid mid level in the organization who had called him. You know, I think hindsight is twenty twenty, but I think if the Cardinals had said said to Kurt at the end of the season, "Hey, we're going to trade you. Where would you like to go? Um, and and what are your preferred destinations?" And Kurt's from the West Coast. And if Kurt had said the West Coast, um, this all whole thing would have. And they had traded him to the Dodgers or the Giants um, or, or whatever. I think this whole thing would have been avoided. Um, but but Kurt was blindsided by this. Um, the GM did not call him. You know, just the backdrop for those who have only lived through the era of free agency, um, the Major League Baseball standard contract, which every player was forced to sign, said, um, we own you for this year, and we own you for next year, too, right? And, and so at the end of every season, almost every player would sign a new contract. And before the, their only, and if the player was traded, that that option year, that sort of option, which is called the reserve clause, um, kicked in for the new team. So the new team owned the player forever and ever. And um, before the 1969 season, I think what really got Kurt Trader was not dropping the fly ball and after the 68 World Series, but um, before the 69 season, Kurt had held out for more money. He, he wanted $100,000, which was superstar money back in 1969. And um, 
He um, stayed away from spring training, which is a player's only leverage in those days. Most of them, almost all of them, did not have agents. They negotiated directly with the club. And so Kurt stayed away from spring training and held out and, and um, eventually settled with the Cardinals for $90,000. But it left a lot of bad blood between Kurt and between the owner of the Cardinals, who he had enjoyed a good relationship with, Gussie Bush. And, um, and then Kurt had a down year in 1969. He batted 285, which was a down year for him. Be a great, great year in this day and age, but a down year for him. And, um, and he was traded, and, but he refused to go. And um, Marvin Miller tells part of the story but on the Burns documentary, but um, it really doesn't tell um, what I found fascinating, what made me want to write the book. When Kurt goes to Miller, first he goes to a St. Louis attorney um, who, who was handling some of his business affairs and had handled his divorce, um, Alan Zerman, and Zerman advises him to go see Mar Marvin Miller. And when he goes to see Marvin Miller, Marvin says, this lawsuit is a million to one shot. And even if this million to one shot comes home, you're never going to see a dime because all those contracts were legal at the time. And the only way people who will benefit will, will, will be prospectively. And Kurt said, will this benefit future players if I win? And Miller said, yes, it will. And, and, and Kurt said, that's good enough for me. And, and it was that kind of altruism was kind of the puzzle that I had in writing this book. What makes somebody who's just been advised by Miller um, to give up his entire career? And he had a good two or three years left with the Phillies. He probably left $250,000 at least on the table with Philadelphia over the course of those three years. And I say at least because um, Philadelphia um, offered him over $100,000. Um, to come to Philly, and Kurt said no, um, and and I just wanted to know what made Kurt want to do this, and you know, the short answer, I think, is the civil rights movement, and 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 his, you know, Kurt's from Oakland, California, he played for a multiracial um, American Legion team of Asians, African Americans, and white players, and, um, you know, when he goes to spring training with the Cincinnati Reds, his first team in um, 1956 um, in Florida and um, tries to get in a white cab and they shoo him into a black cab and he shows up at the white hotel and they send him over to the boarding house with the other black players. That starts this culture shock of Jim Crow that he experiences for the first time that continues during the 1956 season um, in the minor leagues. I'm um, in High Point in Thomasville um, is, is a is a city um, in North Carolina and in the Carolina League. And and even though Kurt was the Carolina player of the year, um, he wanted to go home. He wanted to quit. Things were so bad um, in terms of not being able to eat with his teammates, not being able to sleep in the same place as his teammates, uh, not even be able not to be able to, um, you know, do a lot of basic things that one would want to do and just a lot of racism as one of the few black players in the Carolina League. And the next year he played in Savannah in the Sally League, and it was even worse um, than the Carolina League. And so, you know, and then, you know, these, that really kind of, and I don't want to say radicalized Kurt, but really sensitized him to injustice. And, and he gets traded with the, to the, to the Cardinals after um, his 1947 season in the Sally League, because, um, the, the Reds have too many black players. They have Veda Pinson and Frank Robinson, both of whom um, Kurt went to high school with for a while at McClyman's High in Oakland. And um, they weren't going to have an all-black outfield in Cincinnati. So they trade him uh, to Car the Cardinals um, for nothing, basically. A and, um, and in St. Louis, Kurt, again, was really sensitized to injustice. Even though he wasn't an everyday player at the time, um, he and and Bill White and others um, protested the idea that the Cardinals were um, having spring training in St. Petersburg and their team hotel would not allow black players. And um, Kurt and Bill White um, and Bob Gibson um, were staying at a boarding house, right? You know, separated from the rest of the players. And the Cardinals were responded by buying that team hotel. Um, before the 1962 season, Kurt's idol, Jackie Robinson, um, invites him to come to Mississippi um, to speak at an NAACP rally. Um, 
They're, they're followed by the um, Mississippi Secret Police. Their host is Medgar Evers, who, you know, a few months later is shot in the back and murdered um, by a Klansman. And then after he wins the World Series with the Cardinals in 1964, he tries, um, he um, had been separated with his wife, but they um, remarried, or I think he got divorced, and then he remarried his first wife, and they tried to settle in Walnut Creek, California, in the Bay Area, and um, they rent a house in an upscale white neighborhood, and they're threatened with a shotgun, and the, the owner of the house says, if you move into this house, um, I'm going to shoot you down, and Kirk gets um you know, a court order and armed police protection and moves into the house with the television cameras rolling. And so, you know, it's not surprising if you knew Kurt's history in the minor leagues with the Spring Training Hotel in Mississippi with Jackie Robinson. And in 1964, um, in Alamo, California, um, the, why Kurt sued uh, Major League Baseball. Um, the, the first people he really had to convince in 1969 were the other players and the, the um, MLBPA. And, and let me just back up, right? Marvin Miller is the head of the um, Major League Baseball Players Union. He is not a lawyer. He's a former economist with the Steelworkers Union. Um, but this is really ill-timed for Miller. He had just taken over in 1967. Um, Kurt in, in 1969 um, comes to him and says, I want to sue Major League Baseball over the um, reserve clause. Um, Miller's a strategist. Um, he doesn't want this now. Um, he has only negotiated one collective bargaining agreement, the 1968 basic agreement. Um, and that in that basic agreement, um, the big thing that Miller got the, the, the players was an increase in the pension fund. So this was really a nascent union. The players were not United, as Kurt said in the video, there was not a lot of sal solidarity. There was a lot of skepticism when Kurt goes to, to Puerto Rico um, in, in the winter of 1969 to, to try to persuade the player representatives um, that the Players Association should fund his lawsuit. There was a stellar group of ballplayers from veterans to rookies in that room. Um, one of the veterans was Roberto Clemente. One of the um, you know younger players was Reggie Jackson. And, and um, one of the um, one of the most important questions came from Tom Haller, a catcher for the Giants, and he said, is this a black power thing? And Kurt said, no, this is a player's rights thing. And that won over all the players' representatives. Kurt's in sincerity won over the players' representatives, and they voted unanimously to fund Kurt's lawsuit in exchange for being able to pick Kurt's counsel. And that's an important point that I'm going to come back to um, in a few minutes. Um, so um, the Players Association agrees to fund the lawsuit, even though it's not good timing for Miller, even though he's about to negotiate the 1970 basic agreement, and yet they go forward. And what they go forward with is this letter. And I, I know you probably can't read it, um, but I'm going to read it for you. It's dated December 24th, 1969. Um, it's um, written to Bowie Kuhn, the commissioner of baseball. You saw him at the end of that clip. Um, and, and Kurt writes, after 12 years in the major leagues, I do not feel that I'm a piece of property to be bought and sold, irrespective of my wishes. I believe that any system which produces that result violates my basic rights as a citizen and is inconsistent with the laws of the United States and of the several states. It is my desire to play baseball in 1970, and I am capable of playing. I have received a contract offer from the Philadelphia club, but I believe I have the right to consider offers from other clubs before making any decisions. I therefore request that you make known to all the major league clubs my feelings in this matter and advise them of my availability for the 1970 season. Sincerely, Kurt Flood. And, and that, um, that letter is um, CC to Marvin Miller and to John Quinn, the GM of the Phillies. That puts Bowie Kuhn on notice. Um, Bowie Kuhn replies and said, go jump in a lake, basically. You know, you're bound by your contract. And that says that um, Philadelphia owns you for this year and next year too. And, and Kurt can't um, negotiate with any other team. Kurt's legal team responds by filing a lawsuit um, in the Southern District of New York in Lower Manhattan. Um, and they make, they have um, really um, three claims, but the major claim is about um, the Sherman Antitrust Act. And because this is a CLE, um, I want to get into some law. Um, and and um, just to remind people, um, there are really two types of cases under the Sherman Act. Um, there's a Section 1 case um, that um, 
prohibits any contract combination or conspiracy or strain of trade that affects commerce among the federal several states. There's also a kind of section two claim, which is um, when you're um, so big, basically, um, that you have um, cornered the market, essentially. And Kurt's claim was really about section one um, of the Sherman Act. Um, it was really saying that what the reserve clause was, was a conspiracy among um, the major league teams um, to um, refuse to deal in, in, the, in the parlance of um, antitrust law. Um, it was a group boycott, right? The owners had gotten together and all said, um, we, none of us are going to bid on Kurt's services. Um, only Philadelphia is allowed. Now, under normal um, antitrust law, um, that's a per se violation of the antitrust laws. It's kind of a slam dunk. Um, the reserve clause um, is, is a slam dunk antitrust violation on which Major League Baseball would have been liable for treble damages. Now, most sports cases since 1984 have been judged under rule of reason, which is the restraint of trade has to be found to be unreasonable. That's a, a more flexible standard. But I think even under the a rule of reason analysis, uh, Major League Baseball on the merits um, would have lost because the reserve clause was seen as a perpetual option, a lifetime ownership of Kurt services, and that wasn't um, the least restrictive means um, of achieving the competitive balance um, that Major League Baseball um, was claiming um, that it, it needed um, from the reserve system. So on the merits, Kurt's case is a slam dunk. But as Marvin Miller pointed out, this really was a million to one shot. And the problem was really jurisdictional. If you look at Section 1 of the Sherman Act, um, it says that contract combination or conspiracy in restraint of trade must affect commerce among the several states. That means um, it has to violate, it has to be um, something um, that um, is interstate commerce, right? So, so the question is really a jurisdictional one. Can Kurt sue Major League Baseball in federal court under the Sherman Act? And um, we the and there are there are two prior cases from the Supreme Court on point that say no, and they're a little bit misunderstood, right? They're a little bit misunderstood. Um, the first case um called Federal Baseball um was written um, by Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. and I apologize for the um somewhat disrespectful um stat um caption, but. Um, I have law students and I need to um, interest them in, in these opinions. And I, I just think that Oliver Wendell Holmes had one of the great mustaches of all time. And this is proof positive. Um, but this case involved the Baltimore team from the Federal League, which was, was a rival league or a quote unquote um, third major league um, in the second decade of the 20th century. Um, they had, had merged. Um, the, the Federal League teams had agreed to a merger. Um, with the major leagues. Um, the owner of the Federal League team, the Chicago Whales, um, actually owned the stadium that became um, Wrigley Field. Um, but they left the Baltimore team, the Baltimore Terrapins, out of the merger. The Baltimore Terrapins sued in federal court under the Sherman Act and won. They sued for $80,000 in damages, which were tripled um, to $240,000. That was reversed by the D.C. Circuit um, because they said that Major League Baseball was still sport and not trade. They did not even get to the interstate commerce point. They said it was sport and not trade, right? So if I go back to my previous slide, contract combination or conspiracy in restraint of trade, right? Well, there's no trade there, according to the D.C. Circuit. Now, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr.'s unanimous opinion was different. It was more interested in, in the question on whether the Federal League um, was suing under the properly suing of the Sherman Act on whether there was a in inter whether the commerce was a interstate and b whether it was commerce at all right so those are two different questions um in 1922 what does um Holmes say one of the misunderstandings of federal baseball is that it exempted ma um Major League Baseball from the Sherman Act it really didn't it didn't it not, does not say that all it says is that. As of 1922, Major League Baseball, as constituted, um, was not baseball. Ex they were consisted of a series of exhibitions that were not interstate. 
It's he said the the business is giving exhibitions of baseball which are purely state affairs and the travel to those different cities for those games the transport was mere incident and not the essential thing right he home so he said first it's not interstate holmes's opinions were very short and they they they're this one was super cryptic um and he's but he said also it's not trader commerce right he says although um let me let me get to my i'm having trouble reading my slide there for a second sorry um although um they make money um it would not be called trader commerce in the common it should be in the commonly accepted use of the words um as it is put by defendants personal effort not related to production is not a subject of commerce basically um the labor is not commerce and his examples and this is great for this crowd um he he, he analogized um baseball players traveling um, to different cities as a firm of lawyers traveling to argue a case um or and this is great for um jamestown new york um the chautauqua bureau sending out lecturers you know to different cities he says that's not interstate commerce either so i just want to be clear that holmes did not say base major league baseball was exempt for all time all he's saying was that major league baseball as of 1922 was not interstate commerce. And that's because of the Supreme Court's own decisions. There's a case, of, a famous case um, about um, a federal child labor law in Hammer versus Dagenhart, um, which said manufacturing was not commerce, right? The definition of, of interstate commerce um, was really limited at that time. It was limited to the idea of trade. And so um, the notion of interstate commerce is super narrow. And if you don't believe me, you can read Kevin McDonald in the Journal of Supreme Court History. Kevin McDonald is an, is an expert antitrust lawyer, um, at, was at Jones Day. Uh, he may be um, emeritus now um, at Jones Day, but he, he wrote this article proving this. And, and the real proof was in a case um, Holmes wrote in 1923 involving vaudeville. And, and um and and vaudeville tried um you know, you know they tried to get um this kind of same quote unquote exemption um about uh, whether vaudeville was subject to interstate commerce and and Holmes said um he he kind of rejected um this analogy between baseball and vaudeville and his only point in that vaudeville case it's called Hart um a year after federal baseball was that major league baseball as of 1922 um just didn't satisfy the definition of interstate commerce that over time based on factual circumstances baseball could fit into that definition if the business evolved so th this um this left this very open ended about whether baseball had an exemption um in 1949 was the next really big challenge um, and, and this is in your packet for those of you who want to follow along. The case was Gardella versus Chandler. Danny Gardella um, was kind of a fringe um, outfielder who had jumped to the Mexican League and and to, for more money. And for jumping to the Mexican League, he was blacklisted by the commissioner. I think it was um, Happy Chandler at the time. And, and he sued Major League Baseball under the Sherman Act and um, the trial court. Um, uh, dismissed the claim on jurisdictional grounds, but two rock stars of the um, Second Circuit Court of Appeals, um, Learned Hand and Jerome Frank, were on the panel, and they um, reversed and remanded to see if baseball satisfied the more expanded definition um, of interstate commerce as post-1937. Because as you know, um, the Supreme Court dramatically expanded its concept of interstate commerce um, during the New Deal constitutional crisis and upheld a bunch of Roosevelt's um, New Deal programs and overruled um, Hammer versus Dag and Hart's um, limited definition of, of interstate commerce. And uh, I'm pretty sure on remand, Danny Gardella would have won his case, but instead he settled. Um, you know, Major League Baseball knew that it was going to lose at trial and lose this quote-unquote exemption, it settled with Gardella for $60,000. That was a lot of money. And um, Jerome, you know, Judge Learned Hand didn't really opine um, on the reserve clause, but Jerome Frank, um, in a concurring opinion, um, or in his opinion, um, equated the reserve clause with slavery. 
And that's how we get this idea of a well-paid slave and equating this with slavery and, and um, suggested it might even violate the 13th Amendment. Harry Blackman, when we get to Flood versus Kuhn, ignores this case altogether and ignores two legal giants in Learned Hand and, and Jerome Frank and their opinion on this issue. The next big event occurs two years later when a, a, a congressman, um, Emanuel Seller, um, from New York holds hearings um, in the House Subcommittee on Monopoly Power to study whether Major League Baseball should be subject to the antitrust laws. A bunch of people testified. Um, a big report was written. And, and as of that moment, Congress hadn't um, done anything, hadn't passed legislation exempting Major League Baseball or um, saying that baseball should be subject to the Sherman Act. That gets us to the next big case um, involving, and we're really where the exemption starts is right here. Right, the exemption starts here um, in a case um, involving um, a, a minor league pitcher who's stuck in the New York Yankees um, farm system, and, and his name is George Earl Toulson. And, and Toulson sues Major League Baseball, and there's a couple other companion cases involved um, with Toulson's case. The court grants certiorari in that case, right? And um, and um, the court is at a weird kind of inflection point in 1953. Earl Warren's brand new um, chief justice to the Supreme Court of the United States, he was um, nominated to the court as a recess appointee, which means um, he um, had not been confirmed by the United States Senate. Um, he was so new to the court that Hugo Black was serving as the acting chief justice um, because um, you know Earl Warren had not had any prior judicial experience, had never argued before the Supreme Court of the United States, he was still really getting his feet wet. And um, the court hears oral argument in the case, and they decide um, to decide the case in a per curiam opinion. And they completely misread federal baseball, right? They say it's a one paragraph decision. It should be in your packet. And it says without re-exam, that it begins their per curiam begins, and it was a, a initially drafted by um, by Hugo Black, and it says, without re-examination of the underlying issues, well, let's just stop right there. That's exactly what Holmes wanted people to do. Holmes wanted people to re-examine the underlying issues based on the facts of Major League Baseball, right? And and based on the def the current definition of major of interstate commerce, which had been dramatically expanded post-1937. And given that you have um, radio and the minor leagues and, you know, the beginnings of television, right? You know, it, it, there, there's a much better argument that Major League Baseball is interstate commerce, but, but Toulson misreads um, federal baseball by not re-examining the underlying issue and by relying on stare decisis. And then it adds a line at the insistence of Earl Warren that really makes a mockery of federal baseball, where it says we haven't re-examined federal baseball, but but we're going to say that the in, according to federal baseball, here's what Congress has intended. So far as that decision, federal baseball determines that Congress had no intention of including the business of baseball within the scope of the federal antitrust laws. This sentence, in effect, creates the exemption because it ascribes um, an intent to Congress in passing the Sherman Act um, in the 1890s of intending to exclude baseball. First of all, federal baseball did not say that. Second of all, the Sherman Act's legislative history has no evidence of that. So they are an ascribing to an, an intent to the Sherman Act that does not exist um, in, a, in, I think, was a very poor attempt to get Congress to act. But that addition of congressional intent created this idea of an express exemption for baseball. So far as that decision, federal baseball determines that Congress had no intention of including the business of baseball within the scope of the federal antitrust laws. That's the beginning of the exemption right there in 1953. Now, if they had followed the law on the interstate, on the definition of interstate commerce, if they had read federal baseball properly, um, the court should have held that Major League Baseball um, was um, subject to the Sherman Act, like everything else, um, th that uh, like everything else, but they didn't, and that's where the court um, really fouled up and made a wrong turn and sort of stepped in it 
And then um, the, there was one justice who I would regard, as I've told Greg before, as one of the most underrated justices ever to sit on the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, justice Harold Burton issued a dissent in the case. And he says, what are you guys doing? He says, look at the radio, look at television, look at farm systems. The, uh, those things make baseball seem way more like interstate commerce in 1953 than in 1922. I'm, I'm doing exactly what Oliver Wendell Holmes told us to do. The House subcommittee said baseball was interstate commerce, the seller committee. And all federal baseball said was baseball was not interstate commerce in 1922, not that it was exempt for all time. This is the proper reading of federal baseball, and only Harold Burton gets it right. And, and he cites as proof the vaudeville case, that hard case, that it was only based on that definition at the time, and, um, and says, you know, look, this is um, within um, Congress's power under the interstate commerce to investigate MLB. Of course, this is interstate commerce. Well, they should have listened to Harold Burton because the court gets itself in a box in a bunch of future cases because lo and behold, after they exempt baseball, all these sports come calling for similar exemptions. Um, boxing, which is, you know, besides baseball in the first half of the 20th century, um, the most watched um, professional sports says um, we should be exempt too. And the court says, no, boxing is not exempt from antitrust law. Um, it says federal baseball and Toulson don't apply. Well, finally, Felix Frankfurter kind of wakes up. And Frankfurter's not a sports fan, but he says, I don't see a lick of difference between baseball and boxing. So why are we exempting baseball, but not boxing? Well, he's totally right. He's just should have woken up um, in 1953 and joined Harold Burton's descent, but he didn't. And then it gets even messier in a case called Radovich. I'm involving um, a lineman named Bill Radovich, whose picture you see here in 1957. <laughs> um, the Supreme Court says, hey, football's not exempt either. And it calls um, in a decision, I think, by um, Justice Clark. Um, I could be wrong about that. I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head. It says the baseball exemption is unrealistic, inconsistent, and illogical. And, but it does not apply to any other sport. Well, some very smart lawyers, um, when the Braves um, moved from Milwaukee um, to Atlanta and, and they tried to stop it, um, they said, okay, we're going to take the, the, um, the Supreme Court of the United States at its word. And um, if baseball's not interstate commerce, then it has to be interstate commerce. We're going to sue under the state antitrust laws. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court said, hey, those state antitrust laws are preempted by this baseball exemption under the Sherman Act. Some of those Wisconsin Supreme Court justices lost their seat on the court for so ruling because um, the Braves left for Milwaukee. Now, um, right before Kurt's case, there were two important legal developments. Um, there was a case involving um, the umpires. Um, two umpires were fired um, for incompetence, but really for trying to unionize. And they sued the American League under the antitrust laws. And Judge Henry Friendly, another um, just an absolute um, judicial superstar, along with um, Jerome Frank and Learned Hand, um, wrote in a famous opinion. He called federal baseball not one of Justice Holmes' happiest days, and he would not fall out of his chair if the Supreme Court overruled it, um, but it was not up to the Second Circuit. Even Friendly, though, really mis misread federal baseball as creating an exemption when it didn't. He should have been taking aim at Toulson. And then in 1971, while Kurt's case is pending, Spencer Haywood applies to um, William O. Douglas as the circuit justice for the Ninth Circuit. And Douglas says, hey, basketball is not exempt either. And the NBA draft violates the antitrust laws and the rules on draft eligibility. So you've got a trend um, and, and a moment where there's a chance the court might overrule um, Toulson, but, but sort of unlikely. I think it's a long shot. And, um, and the weird thing about Kurt's case when it progresses through the courts is um, any federal judge um, who'd kind of studied federal jurisdiction would know um, that the court didn't have jurisdiction to hear the case. And that um, if the court doesn't have federal jurisdiction, 
then you dismiss the case. No trial, no discovery, dismissal. Well, there was no discovery in Kurt's case, but it did go to trial because their trial judge, Irving Ben Cooper, was a total publicity hound. And he brought in all these celebrities on both sides. And as the Burns documentary showed, Bill Veck, um, Jackie Robinson, Hank Greenberg, and Jim Brosnan, um, all former players and executives at the time, um, testified in favor of Kurt, but a parade of witnesses testified against him and, and against this idea um, that the reserve, that baseball um, was, was interstate commerce or that on the merits, whether the reserve clause um, violated um, the antitrust laws, all things that Irving Ben Cooper shouldn't have been discussing because he didn't have jurisdiction. And then he dismisses the case after the trial, citing federal baseball. The Second Circuit affirms Kurt during this process has sat out the 1970 season during this trial, and this is really important, Marvin Miller is negotiating the ma new Major League Baseball Collective Bargaining Agreement, the 1970 Basic Agreement, and that's really key. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute. I promise. But just keep that in mind. So Kurt does something in 1971 that the Burns documentary kind of glosses over, but I think um, was one of two several big mistakes in his case. The first was something Kurt did allude to in the documentary. No current players sh showed up in New York during Kurt's trial to show support for him. None. Even though, you know, you had team, you know, the Mets and the Yankees, players coming into town constantly, you could have had players showing up in that courtroom, showing their solidarity, and they didn't. I don't know if it would have made a difference, um, but it was certainly from a public relations standpoint um, where – um, much of the media was against Kurt's lawsuit. Um, I think this would have gone a long way to show um, that Kurt wasn't out there on his own. Um, Marvin Miller admitted this was a huge strategic mistake. Another huge um, strategic mistake was um, Kurt made an aborted comeback um, in 1971 with the Washington Senators. And um, he was in dire financial straits. Um, his outside photography business was going bankrupt. He owed um, back child support and alimony. Um, he was he needed to really um, declare bankruptcy and he couldn't um, because his biggest asset was this lawsuit and he had promised the players um, in Puerto Rico that he would see it through to the end and so he doesn't declare bankruptcy and instead he makes this comeback with the centers and Kurt's lawyers um, get an agreement with MLB that this won't moot the lawsuit but it made the case seem moot and from an optics standpoint when Kurt comes back um, for only a couple of weeks and then leaves for Mallorca, Spain, it made his, his case seem somewhat moot or, or, or irrelevant. And I think had Kurt still been sitting out in 1971 and 1972, I think um, there would have been more gravity um, to the whole thing. Uh, he would have looked more like Cop Callan Kaepernick, just to make a modern um, example, as somebody who was blackballed by the sport. Um, so Kurt has left for Spain. The Supreme Court shocks everyone by granting certiorari, right? The reason why it's shocking, um, if um, there's no jurisdiction um, to hear the case under the Sherman Act, um, the path of least resistance for the Supreme Court, if it wants to um, just let the lower court decision stand, is simply to deny certiorari. Um, but the court doesn't do that. It grants cert. So you think the, the court might rule in Kurt's favor. And court, Kurt's team thinks he has an ace in the hole um, in his advocate. Kurt's counsel, chosen by Marvin Miller, this was Marvin Miller's second error, um, was um, his choice of counsel, um, was Arthur Goldberg, the former Supreme Court justice. Um, he, um, was, uh, he had gotten to know Miller when Goldberg was the general counsel of the Steelworkers Union and a first-rate labor law advocate. Let me say that right then and there. Um, Goldberg had, had participated in the argument in, in the steel seizure case um, where Justice Jackson wrote his famous opinion. He was a first-rate advocate at one time. Um, he then um, becomes John F. Kennedy's Secretary of Labor and succeeds um, in 1962, succeeds Felix Frankfurter on the Supreme Court, but leaves after just three years um, because um, Lyndon Johnson, who's now president, um, persuades Goldberg to become the ambassador of the United Nations because he promises to Goldberg if he becomes ambassador of the United Nations um, that he'll be able to end the Vietnam War, that Johnson um, in 65 wants to end the war. 
and that Goldberg will get all the credit and then Goldberg could launch his own political career. And Goldberg has a huge ego. He believes Johnson. He becomes the ambassador of the UN and um, as we know, um, does not end the Vietnam War. Um, he, he, after, um, in, he serves in the Johnson administration, then becomes a partner at Paul Weiss in New York City. And um, before he agrees to become Kurt's counsel, Miller's read in the paper that Goldberg's thinking about running for governor of New York. And they go way back and Miller says to Goldberg, he says, hey, um, are you, you can't run for governor of New York and be Kurt's counsel. And Goldberg promises that he's not running for governor of New York. And he breaks that promise. Runs anyway, loses. He's really distracted during much of Kurt's trial and appeal. Certainly during the trial. And likewise, he doesn't really prepare for his Supreme Court argument, his first time appearing back at the Supreme Court since he was one of the justices, and he really freezes. He almost like has a mental moment where he gets stage fright and he starts reciting the facts, um, almost like a feedback loop. It was a disastrous um, oral argument. Before I play a little bit of that oral argument, Greg, I know I'm almost an hour in, but I want to play some argument and um and 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 talk for a little bit longer. Um, but I want to just tell you what the arguments are. Their first argument for Flood's legal team is that the Sherman Act applies because in 1969, baseball's interstate commerce because of radio, TV, the minor leagues, etc. Their second argument is that the reserve clause violates the 13th Amendment. Now, I know the reporter in that clip in the Burns documentary mentioned that. It's standing outside the Supreme Court, but they dropped that claim um, after their Second Circuit appeal. So that, that claim is not before the Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And their third claim, which is really their hard argument, and the one that the justices are really struggling with, is, hey, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Either baseball's interstate commerce or it's interstate commerce. And if it's inter interstate commerce, then the state antitrust laws apply. And they also included state antitrust claims. That's a hard, that's a hard argument for the court to get around, right? It's either interstate or interstate. Pick one. Either way, we win. Major League Baseball's arguments are super fascinating. Their main argument is this is a labor issue and not an antitrust issue. And therefore, it's exempt under what today we call the non-statutory labor exemption. And that's um, a very complicated way of saying that if you're in a labor union and you agree to a collective bargaining agreement, you can't then turn around and sue under the antitrust laws. You can't have, bo have it both ways. And, and that's a hard argument for the court. And that's kind of a new-ish argument. Um, there is a Yale Law Journal article published in 1971 um, that's co-authored by Ralph Winter, who's a Yale Law professor and future Second Circuit Justice, who said that all um, sports unions should not be allowed to sue under the, under the antitrust laws under this non-statutory labor exemption idea. Now, they would respond to the state law antitrust law argument by saying that any state antitrust claims are pre preempted by the Sherman Act or violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. I can get to that in a little bit. Their third argument is stare decisis, which means let the decision stand. And they say, look, Major League Baseball has a lot of reliance interests um, on its exemption, um, the development of the minor leagues, franchise relocation. They've in invested a lot of money um, in, in the minor leagues and in, 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 in their stadia. And, um, you know, they can't, um, lose the exemption, and even in, in developing the players themselves. Um, and, and then I think their last argument is that Congress has not acted um, since Toulson to remove the exemption. And, and I'll talk about that one too. That one um, is the weakest of all the arguments and oddly um, the one that the Supreme Court chooses. Let me go to the oral argument real quick. Greg, is that okay if I do that? Yeah, Can I keep yeah. rolling? Yep, keep going. I need, just need to change my screen here. Um, I just want to play first a colloquy 
between Justice Brennan and Arthur Goldberg. And they're really good friends, right? Go Brennan and Goldberg were friends. And um, Brennan, Goldberg's rambling on about the facts. And Brennan asks him a really important question about this idea of whether a union should be able to sue under the antitrust laws. Let me just play this short clip. And I shall discuss that when I come to the labor exemption. I hope you're going to get to that. I will move that. Uh, because of the shortness of time. We have these three problems. Now, listen, I know I have a bunch of lawyers in this room. When a Supreme Court justice asks you a question at oral argument and you say, um, and I'll put the language up there. No, and I shall get that when I come when I come to the labor exemption. You've just your friend friend has teed up the other side's best argument and wants a response to it, and you don't get that. And you say, I hope, and then Brennan says, I hope you're going to get to that. And Goldberg says, I will move fast in the courtroom, laughs. That shows you in, in how much trouble Goldberg is in um, before the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, just just a, a really a, a world of trouble. And and the the advocates on the other side are just excellent for Major League Baseball. Lou Hoynes um, was 36 years old. He was the general the counsel for the National League. He's arguing his first Supreme Court case. And he does a ma uh, an amazing job of pressing this labor exemption issue. And I, I want to play um a clip of that if you'll bear with me in getting getting to um, what this question, okay? Um, let, let me just try to do that real quick here. Thurgood Marshall is giving Lou Hoynes business. And, and really, Thurgood Marshall's point in questioning is he really thinks that the union is not acting in Kurt's best interest. And I'm not sure Marshall's right, but, he, you know, Thurgood Marshall's former law clerk is Ralph Winner. The law professor who's written this article on the labor exemption in the Yale Law Journal. And so he's got a lot of questions about this. And let me just play this clip for you because um, I think it's a really good example of, uh, of Hoynes' advocacy vis-a-vis um, -vis Thurgood Marshall. Now, wouldn't you say under the reserve clause there was no room for bargaining? No, I, I certainly would not say that. I would say that the reserve clause itself the very core of the reserve clause is a subject admitted by both sides, a mandatory subject of bargaining, and something about which bargaining was going on when interrupted by the tendency to filing of this lawsuit. And it is back to that forum, Your Honor, that we believe this matter should be remitted. You mean back to the union? Back to the collective bargain, uh, the bargaining table, Your Honor, yes. Well, look, that's a really important point, and that really encapsulates MLB's case. MLB is saying, look, this is a labor issue, not an antitrust issue. We can be reasonable. They even put their money where their mouth was during the negotiations of the 1970 basic agreement. They um, gave the, the players grievance arbitration and that is the ability to file grievances um, before independent arbitrators, not the commissioner, independent arbitrators. And that proves to be incredibly important. Um, so I, I just want to keep in mind that Major League Baseball's um, point here is, is that this is a labor issue, not an antitrust issue. Now, that wouldn't really control franchise relocation or even the minor leagues because the minor league players aren't unionized at the time. So Hoynes recognized he was walking a tightrope, but that was really the thrust of their argument, which was really hard for the court to deal with. Here's what happened at conference. Here are the votes. So I just want to go down the list because I think it helps to, to visualize it. Chief Justice Ver Berger votes for flood. William O. Douglas votes for flood. Brennan votes for flood. 
Potter Stewart votes for MLB. Byron White votes for MLB. Thurgood Marshall votes for MLB after really hammering Lou Hoynes. Harry Blackman votes for MLB. Lewis Powell votes for Flood, but stay tuned on that vote. And William Rehnquist votes for MLB. This is a five to four case initially in favor of MLB. A good argument by Flood's advocate before the Supreme Court of the United States might have persuaded one of the justices to change votes. Indeed, a lot of stuff happened after this conference, after the oral argument. The first thing that happened was Lewis Powell recused himself after oral argument because he owned Anheuser-Busch stock. Anheuser-Busch owns the St. Louis Cardinals. And Lewis Powell had promised at his confirmation hearings after some, some of Richard Nixon's other judicial nominees had gotten in trouble for owning stock in cases that they sat on as appellate judges. He said, I'll recuse myself in any case in which I own stock. He recuses himself. So it's now five to three for MLB. But a crazy thing happens. When the opinion gets circulated, Thurgood Marshall switches his vote to flood. It's now five to four. Okay. It's deadlocked. And the assignment goes like this. I'm going back to this slide because the senior justice in the majority, as you see, is the fourth most senior justice. It's Potter Stewart. And he assigns the case um, to one of the newer justices on the court, to Harry Blackman, right? And so Blackman's writing the decision. And when Blackman circulates, it's now 4-4 four, four when he circulates. He needs a fifth vote. And he gets it from his childhood friend, the Chief Justice, Warren Berger, they were childhood friends um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, Blackman was the best man in Berger's wedding. They were um, called the Minnesota Twins, right? Um, but Blackman's opinion was an embarrassment. It, was, it starts with this ode to baseball, um, you know, citing Casey at the bat. And, and he really, in writing the opinion, obsesses over this list of baseball greats that he compiles from books um, such as um, The Glory of Their Times and the Law Clerks kind of make fun of him, suggesting different names of great players. And, and the opinion, that first part of the opinion, such an embarrassment that Byron White and I think William Rehnquist refused to join part one. Uh, it's almost unheard of for a justice's opinion for someone to not join the facts. And um, here's what Blackman says in the decision. Blackman concedes that Major League Baseball is interstate commerce. And, um, and, and the question has to be, well, why, if you concede that Major League Baseball is interstate commerce, do the antitrust laws not apply? Well, first, he says, because of stare decisis, right? Uh, but, but the second reason might be because of problems with retroactivity. Well, that's easily solved. You could make the decision prospective, right? But the third reason is really crazy. And, and, and that's, um, he says, because of Congress's, and this is a direct quote, positive inaction, this is up to Congress to fix. Anyone who knows anything about statutory interpretation is that Congress's default mode is not to do anything. And that you can't interpret a federal law based on Congress's inaction, right? Because that's its default position. And, you know, if you look at Congress's inaction, there were a lot of bills in Congress between 1950 and 1972 to exempt all four major professional sports, and those bills didn't pass either. So that argument really is a red herring. And, and that's what, what Blackman bases his decision on, Congress's positive inaction. It's a really bad argument. He spent very little time um, developing the reasoning for that. And then lastly, he rejects um, Flood's state antitrust law claims if Major, major League Baseball was intrastate commerce. Um, he says um, they would violate the dormant commerce clause. And that's the idea of, of a, a state law interfering with interstate commerce in the absence of a correct congressional law. But that doesn't really make sense either, because if baseball is interstate commerce, then the Sherman Act should apply. And there is a federal law on point. So it's either it should be preempted. It shouldn't be um, the dormant commerce clause. And, and then. 
on this idea of the labor exemption, Blackman kind of punts, right? Um, so um, there was some language in the reserve um, in, in the collective bargaining agreement that sort of um, accepted the reserve clause from that collective bargaining agreement. And therefore, the court really didn't know what to do with that argument and just kind of punts on it. Now, Thurgood Marshall, in his dissent, he goes from in the majority to dissenting, says this is a hard case, right? And he's correct to say the court doesn't often overrule um, itself on cases of federal statutory interpretation, but um, Toulson was dead wrong. He said our, our remedy could be prospective. He said stare decisis alone is not a good reason to keep federal baseball. And he would um, remand the case to the trial court to see if, um, if, if they're exempt from federal law only on the issue of whether the reserve clause had been collectively bargained, if it was part of the 1970 basic agreement. So he's really interested in this labor exemption issue, and he would remand on that. I just want to point out one thing. The Brethren, that book by Bob Woodward and Scott Armstrong, claims that Thurgood Marshall um, objected to Blackman's list of great baseball greats um, because there were no Black players on the list, and that Blackman had left out Satchel Paige um, and a few others. And that Marshall made him include them. Um, well, that's hogwash um, because at least the drafts in Blackman's papers show that the black players um, were in there from the get go. Um, so um, that's um, at least one strike against um, the brethren. The other dissent, and the dissent that I really think is fantastic, is um, William O. Douglas. Um, he he um, says that federal baseball is a derelict in the stream of the law, and he and he drops a footnote in his opinion saying he regrets joining Toulson. I think he's the only justice um, on the court um, from Toulson. And um, he says he regrets joining um, Toulson and that congressional inaction is a bad guy um, because uh, is a bad guy because um, Congress hasn't expressly exempted baseball or any other sport. And the only exemption that we have um, is, is for broadcasting and that's the Sports Broadcasting Act. And he says, hey, this is the Supreme Court's mistake and the mistake was really Toulson not federal baseball, and we should fix it. Um, so um, those are the opinions. And, and I, I just want to briefly kind of add a couple of postscripts. Well, how if Kurt Flood lost five to three on a ridiculous opinion um, by Harry Blackman, did Kurt Flood get, did Major League Baseball get free agency? Well, as I said, um, in 1970 during the trial, when MLB says we can be reasonable, and they throw the players a bone by giving them grievance arbitration, well, that becomes, um, for the players, the kind of silver bullet. Um, and um, the first free agent, and most people forget this, was Catfish Hunter. Um, Catfish Hunter became a free agent because um, the Oakland A's owner, Charlie Finley, had breached his contract by not um, setting up half of the contract um, as an annuity. And an independent arbitrator, um, Peter Seitz, um, ruled that um, Finley was in breach, and the remedy for that breach um, was to make Hunter a free agent. And um, Hunter signs a multi-million dollar contract um, with the New York Yankees. I think it was $1.9 million. And that really opened up everybody's eyes to what Kurt was fighting for and the possibilities of free agency. Um, in Major League Baseball and all of professional sports because of what Hunter, um, a great pitcher, got on the open market. A year later, two other players, two other pitchers, Andy Messersmith and Dave McNally, also filed grievances. They've done something called playing out their option year. At the beginning of my talk, I said the re reserve clause um, says, if we own you for this year and next year too, well, um, the um, Messersmith and McNally and, and other players had tried this before, um, essentially played out that option year. They played a season under their own contract, old contracts, right? So um, they said, okay, if you own us for this year and next year too, we're going to play next year without a contract, and then we should be free agents. And Peter Seitz, who was still the arbitrator, the owners hadn't fired them. They could have, and they should have, um, because he had ruled against him in the Hunter case. Um, he ruled um, that the reserve clause was only a one-year option and not 
a perpetual one, not a lifetime option. And that essentially ended the reserve system, ended um, and, and led to free agency because at that point, um, the players and the owners got together and negotiated a free agency system um, in the next collective bargaining agreement. So Kurt's lawsuit, although a loss at the Supreme Court, was really, I think, a win for the players because they won grievance arbitration um, that led to free agency um, in 1975. Um, what happened to Kurt? Well, we know a little bit. Um, now, um, the Ken Burns documentary um, glosses over some of it, um, but um, in 1976, um, he returned to the United States from Spain, where he had been self-exiled, um, drunk and destitute. Um, from 1976 to 1986, um, Kurt had a really hard time. Um, he struggled um, to regain his sobriety in Oakland. He briefly announced games for the Oakland A's. Um, as a color commentator, that really didn't work out. But in 1986, he really got his life together. Um, he um, married a former girlfriend, the actress um, Judy Pace, um, who's pictured second to the left. Um, here, um, a big moment for Kurt came during the 1994 baseball strike um, when um, he appeared at a meeting in Atlanta um, of um, the players and received a standing ovation. And that was really the first time um, the union had publicly ad acknowledged um, what Kurt had done for them. And then, of course, he makes that star turn in Ken Burns's baseball documentary that you listen to. And um the people who were in that documentary and Burns himself um, had um, an event at the White House and Kurt um, got to meet um, President and Mrs. Clinton. And, and you see their picture here um, with Bill Clinton in the middle and, and Hillary Clinton to his right. Um, I just point out, like, look how young they look. It's kind of remarkable um, how young the Clintons are in that, in that photograph. Um, but sadly, um, when Kurt has finally started to receive his due um, in 94, um, he died of throat cancer. Um, in 1997. And, um, um, but um, Kurt's story kind of continues here. And where it continues is after the baseball strike, um, the union um, got what they thought was a concession from Major League Baseball. Um, they got um, so what they called the Kurt Flood Act of 1998. It's really unfortunate. Um, it's um, named that. It removed the exemption. Baseball's exemption from the antitrust laws as it relates um, to um, employment issues of major league players. And, and that's um, really um, a nothing burger because um, the Supreme Court had ruled in 1996 in a case called Brown versus Pro Football Inc. that unions cannot um, be unionized and, and, and sue under the antitrust laws. So as long as the MLBPA exists, they can't sue under the antitrust laws. So that's a nothing burger. What the players got, nothing. And what the owners got is a laundry list of what the Curt Flood Act didn't cover, which includes the minor leagues, the draft, franchise relocation, umpires, the Sports Broadcasting Act. Basically, it got an affirmation in Congress um, of the antitrust exemption. And um, the union got nothing and lost a ton. It was a huge strategic mistake. Um, by the Major League Baseball Players Association, um, and it really hurt minor league players um, who um, were non-unionized, so they didn't have a protection of the union, um, and um, they were now, um, according to this law, um, ex exempt from suing under um, the antitrust laws based on the Curt Flood Act. Um, last thing, and then I'll turn it over to Greg, um, will Flood v. Kuhn be overruled? Um, Flood v. Kuhn is an embarrassing decision. The court almost never cites it in a positive light. I mean, in a recent antitrust case about the amateurism rules of the NCAA and NCAA versus Alston, the court unanimously, the great thing about antitrust cases is there's really a lack of political valence in these cases. As you saw from Kurt's case, um, liberal and conservative justices were all over the map. That's true also today. Nine nothing. They ruled that the NCAA's amateurism rules um, violated the Sherman Act. But in that majority opinion by Neil Gorsuch, who is an expert on antitrust law and used to teach it, basically put MLB on notice about how aberrational and unsupported Flood v. Kuhn is. There is bipartisan support in Congress um, to end baseball's antitrust exemption. Also, this is a 
uh, and you know i know mlb's um, m- monopoly is strong and, and their lobbying efforts in congress is super strong um but um mlb is on the run um they uh, allowed minor leaguers just recently um to unionize they the the players voted to unionize and then rather than sort of contest it um in the nlrb um the court the M- the major league baseball um agreed to allow the minor leaguers to unionize um because they want the benefit of that labor exemption i think they're worried about um the antitrust exemption from toolson going away um this is a supreme court as most of you know um that is not real concerned with following precedent the only good argument in flood versus coon was starry decisis and following precedent and you know this nine nothing decision in alston should have sent shivers down the spine of major league baseball there is a case pending in the lower courts about minor league teams there was a contraction of minor league teams by major league baseball one of those contracted teams the staten island yankees and a few others sued major league baseball under the sherman act that case is pending in the lower courts and what i'll say about that is stay tuned folks i'll be really interested if the supreme court of the united states grants certiorari in that staten island yankees case I, I think there's a very good chance that Flood versus Kuhn could be overruled. Uh, Greg, um, I hope I haven't gone on for too long, but uh, fire away. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, and I'm delighted on so many fronts, personal as well as professional, to get a master's class in uh, baseball. Uh, as um, I mentioned, I'll, I'll be uh, put myself on the stake here a little bit when I went mentioned to you last night, 1973, I wrote my senior thesis on the Flood versus Coon case and it, anticipating from an economic plan what would happen to baseball should the reserve clause uh, be ended. And I was so wrong, so that's why I'm not sharing it in this booklet. But, uh, and so uh, it's a great for me to, to be corrected on so many fronts by you. Brad. Uh, and, and of particular interest, uh, the follow-up uh, luncheon speaker uh, is the uh, John Dandies. John is the president of Bison's uh, uh, Rich Products uh, Sports Entertainment. That's the, They own the Buffalo Bison's, and he's actively interested in what's going on in Congress right now uh, as they are reviewing this whole antitrust exemption. And of course, the last sentence you had was talking about the Staten Island Yankees, which was a member of the New York Penn League, of, uh, of which Jamestown team was a part for so, so many years. So you, uh, you brought it really home, really home, and I'll uh, report whatever John uh, talks about during lunch. In fact, why don't you, that's probably a segue to help me, is what is going on in Congress right now? Have you followed any of the congressional hearings uh, so far as the antitrust exemption? No, I haven't. I have, and I have to be honest. I, I, I know there are even people on this call um, who, who, who know more about this than I do. Um, I do know there's support on both sides of the aisle, um, a co-sponsored bill by Republicans and Democrats. And, and you know, 20 years ago, that would be so what? But I think, you know, anytime you get Republicans and Democrats ag- agreeing on, on something, um, it, it's kind of remarkable today. Um, and there's also bipartisan support, I think, in, in general, Greg, um, uh, for um, that monopoly is bad, um, particularly when it comes to big tech. If you think about the bipartisan outrage about big tech and, and the the need to hold big tech's um, feet to the fire um, in terms of the antitrust laws, that doesn't bode well um, for, for Major League Baseball either, right? I just think... Um, you know, I think there's a sense on both sides of the aisle that monopoly is bad. Now, I, I, let me just say um, that there there is an, a major league team or a minor league team in so many of these senators and congressmen's districts, and that their lobbying shop, MLB's lobbying shop, is unparalleled, and that a lot of arms will be twisted. And, and um, I think it's going to be a hot, a heavy lift. Congress to do the work to um, remove baseball's exemption 
um, through through legislation. So I'm not optimistic on that front. I'm actually more optimistic that the Supreme Court will bury um, Toulson and Flood v. Kuhn since it was their mess. So I, I, I think that in this case, um, we, we've got a better chance. Um, even, um, again, I, I don't think it matters that this is a conservative court. I, I think um, justices like Neil Gorsuch um, and, and Brett Kavanaugh are outraged um, about, um, you know, abuses of monopoly power in this sort of way. Um, you know, in the past toward minor leaguers and, and most recently um, toward minor league teams and contraction. And um, th that baseball, um, it, it, I think this exemption has shown what happens when a monopolist has an exemption and how they abuse that power. Could you envision what happens to organized baseball the minute either the Supreme Court or Congress passes legislation which eliminates the antitrust exemption? What would change? It, it would force baseball to get its act together, to innovate, and to look more like the NBA and to have a kind of, I'm not going to mince words, to have a commissioner who's kind of forward thinking about how to grow the game, to realize that it's not an us-them mentality, right? And to not make comments denigrating the World Series trophy or denigrating um, or, or saying that minor leaguers are making a minimum wage when they're not. And to realize, like Adam Silver does in the NBA, that he's involved in a partnership with the players and, and that he needs to figure out how to grow the game. It just may force MLB to be less of a dinosaur and, and to be more of an innovator and put it on the same playing field um, as other professional sports. My my boss is over my shoulder for just one second, Brad, because he's she's going to make a very important announcement. I'm breaking in for your second attendance verification code. It is ZWE536. Zebra Whiskey Echo 536, ZWE 536. Thank you. And just for the audience, you, everybody needs to know that this guy was a sports writer. So it's not like he's some academic sitting down in Georgetown. He cut his teeth as a sports writer in Baltimore, as a Baltimore Orioles fan. And in fact, he covered the most famous game in Baltimore Orioles history for the a, a, a local newspaper. You want to briefly talk about that in your, you, 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 you blew right by that in the biography. I, I hear you. I, I wouldn't say Ripken. I was um, covering for the Baltimore Sun um, when Cal Ripken broke Lou Gehrig's um, record on 2131. And uh, Greg, I know you have the date on the tip of your tongue. I don't. December 6, 1995. I was there that day, and I was a young sports writer with the Baltimore Sun. I don't think that's the greatest day in Oriole history. I'd take the 83 World Series or the 70 World Series with Brooks Robinson um, either day. Um, but um, that's the kind of fan aspect in me. But it was certainly a high watermark for the franchise um, and, um, and super memorable. But, you know, I got there out of college in 94, and the baseball strike hit. And I sort, sort of started edu educating myself about – the history of antitrust and labor um, in, in um, professional baseball. And I was kind of embarrassed as a sports writer about how little I knew about Kurt Flood, that here I was covering baseball for a major newspaper and didn't really understand what Kurt had done. And I really, that first year as a reporter, saw Kurt's story as a great one man takes on the establishment story. Um, and I just read um, Anthony Lewis is amazing book, Gideon's Trumpet, and really, which is about Clarence Earl Gideon, um, who didn't have counsel and was convicted of a, um, you know, of a burglary in a pool hall in Florida and, and was indigent. Um, and, and Clarence Earl Gideon wins based on a handwritten petition of the United States Supreme Court. I'm um, in a very famous um, decision establishing a right to counsel um, in all felony cases. Um, I saw Kurt's story way back then as baseball's Gideon's trumpet. And even though Kurt lost at the Supreme Court, I really think he won. Um, he really raised aware, not just public awareness um, about um, just how unlevel that playing field is, to borrow the title um, of your program today, between the owners and the players. And just by going on Howard Cosell and saying a well-paid slave 
um, is nonetheless a slave. And Cosell, of course, um, was ESPN, Fox, CBS, and, and every other network rolled into one back then, right, in terms of power. Um, to say that really opened people's eyes to the inequities in the game. And then to force the union to say that, hey, not the union, I'm sorry, the league to say, um, hey, this is a labor issue, not an antitrust issue. We can be reasonable. I, I just want to point out in the next basic agreement, they get some really important things in 1973. The two concessions they get in 73, even after they've quote unquote lost in the Supreme Court, they get um, first they get something that was at the time was called the Kirk Flood rule. And today we know it as the 10 and 5 rule. And that is um, with 10 years of major league service time and five years with the same team that you can veto any trade. That rule still exists today. And um, and, and you, uh, lots of players have exercised it. The last uh, member of the Orioles that exercised it was Adam Jones, their kind of team leader and star um, outfielder. And and he, the, as the Orioles were in decline, they tried to trade Adam Jones. And he said, no, I'm, ex I'm exercising my... 10 and 5 rule rights. And, um, you know, these rights have to be waived all the time, and that's all because of Kurt Flood. And, and the second major concession in that 73 basic agreement, after MLB has argued this is a labor issue, is salary arbitration, which is after three years of major league service time, um, the players and the owners go to salary arbitration. And so years, you know, four through six, um, the, these um, th they have salary arbitration. That the owners are still regretting giving the players salary arbitration, right? And, and again, that's a major gain from Kurt Flood that's still baked into the current collective bargaining agreement as is the 10 and five rule. And, and Kurt Flood deserves credit for both of those, which was why they named the 10 and five rule at the time, the Kurt Flood rule. Well, I just wanna say, Brad, you deserve a lot of credit for bringing to our attention here for all those publicly in person, in person and those who are many watching online, uh, this great, great uh, story. Uh, though it's 50 years later from the Supreme Court case, it is so relevant today, uh, especially in the wild world of minor leagues of which our world is a part here. Yeah, well, well I appreciate that. I, and one other thing I just wanted to mention, Greg, was you brought up the sort of, and even the the announcer in the case in the in the Ken Burns documentary brought up um, that that the the best teams will get all the best players and the worst teams will get all all the all the scrubs and uh, first of all I don't think that's true today um, but but as I told you last night Greg when we were talking Bowie Kuhn was um, really not a popular commissioner and he was described um, by Charlie Finley as a stuffed shirt um, and he he called him um, a village idiot um, those are Charlie Finley's words, not mine. Um, but Kuhn was so fixated on um, the end of the reserve clause as, as the end of the game um, that he didn't really see the train coming. And the, the train that was coming and that ran him over uh, was the beginning of, of cable television. And once um, Ted Turner starts TBS and, um, and WGN starts in, in Chicago, um, the train has left the station right on cable television and these um and the inequities between big market and tel and small market teams are really about these local television rights and, and these um cable stations like Nesson um like um the Yes network um that that just make um the Yankees and the Red Sox and the Cubs and the Braves and the Dodgers um they have so much more cash at their disposal um, to spend on player development and to spend on 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 ball players and and that's what I think really makes MLB different than the NFL, where the NFL's sharing all their money equally. But you know, Kuhn couldn't even get a more equitable distribution of that cable money because he just wasn't fixated. He wasn't. He didn't see its impact on how local the disparity on local television revenue could create a have and have not system um, in MLB. And that's something, again, for a future commissioner to fix as we move away from cable television and as we move into streaming. And, and, and soon, cable television will be a dinosaur, much like network TV. And then MLB has an opportunity to kind of reinvent itself.
And that's what I mean by without an exemption, maybe MLB will start to innovate and really rethink its economic model um, in, a, in a world where um, streaming is everything. Well, enjoy the playoffs via streaming, Brad Snyder. And uh, thank you very much for all your time. No, you, thank you. I appreciate it, Greg. And, and I like personally thank you so much for making the extraordinary effort. I know that uh, pounding down some tea and whatever else you had to take on to get through this today uh, was above and beyond, and we really appreciate it. Thank it's you. My, my pleasure, Greg. Next time, I just want to come to the Jackson Center in person. So okay. thanks so much. We'll make that a reality. All Thank right. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we are going to take, again, a little bit of a break for lunch. We will reconvene at about 12.25. Um, for those who are online, join us back uh, on the Zoom at that time. Thank you. <laughs>